Welcome to Uncle Daily. Today we have the privilege of hosting Professor Waisaki, a distinguished figure in the world of clinical oncology. Currently, he leads the clinical oncology department at University Hospital and heads the Faculty of Oncology at J. Gilonian University Medical College in Krakow, Poland. A graduate from the University of Medical Sciences in Poznan, he earned his PhD in molecular biology in the same year he graduated and further honed his skills at esteemed institutions like Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York and the Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Professor Waisaki's contributions to the field are manifold. He has been the president of the Polish Society of Clinical Oncology twice and has played a pivotal role in shaping Poland's national cancer strategy as an advisor to the Polish Minister of Health. His clinical expertise spans the systematic treatment of various cancers and has been the forefront of developing innovative chemotherapy-based therapies. With over 100 peer-reviewed articles to his name and a role as the principal investigator in more than 70 international clinical studies, Professor Waisaki's impact on oncology is undeniable. His dedication to education is evident in his extensive portfolio of lectures, online courses, and presentations, benefiting oncologists, residents, and medical students alike. As of 2023, he is also a proud member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology International Affairs Committee and the chair of ASCO European Regional Advisory Council. Welcome to Onco Daily. Professor Vaisaki, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, could you share with us what inspired you to pursue a PhD in molecular biology, especially like in your early career? What inspired you to become or to investigate this field more? Well, actually, it was during my uh, university. Uh, I had an option and opportunity to to start working in a lab uh, because in Poland there is uh, students uh, in early stages of their tr- training, uh, and and actually their university career they have the option to be linked with some basic scientific uh, well uh, laboratories and i actually chose uh, molecular biology lab and then uh, tumor immunology lab because this was the first actually uh, opportunity i had and uh, actually i was so overwhelmed by all aspects and all those scientific backgrounds that uh, were explored at that time that that actually well it was so interesting that I decided to uh, explore it uh, while you know being trained as a medical doctor but then having the opportunity to do some basic research during the medical school and it was uh, well extremely important for my future career because actually it opened my eyes on what actually molecular biology was and what was actually uh, cancer immunology and everything was concentrated on oncology because the lab I was uh, involved in some basic research was based in a comprehensive cancer center uh, in the city where I did my uh, medical uh, school. So this is how it started. But, you know, being, well, actually, as a chance and opportunity that, uh, well, I could have found something else, but I found a lab that was involved in cancer research and that actually sped up the whole idea of further uh, medical development and speciality, choosing the speciality, which was uh, clinical oncology. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I really find like uh, molecular biology and basic science is very important. Like if you, if you want to become a good clinician, if you don't understand like uh, how things work on a molecular level, 
um, you can't really understand like what are the tools that you are using. Eventually, like when you prescribe a treatment for someone, it's like you are using a tool that have its own benefits and its own uh, risks. So if you don't understand the molecular level, how this chemotherapy or drug works, you can't really translate that to uh, the clinical science. Um, I do share uh, lots of uh, your uh, love to molecular science, but unfortunately, I didn't have the chance uh, to work in a lab yet. So hopefully I'm working on that. Um, and we talked earlier about um, your career. And as I mentioned that you are uh, the current head of the clinical oncology department at University Hospital and the faculty of oncology at J. Jolinian University Medical College. So what are the some, some of the pivotal leadership responsibilities that you undertake in this role? Well, actually, uh, Jagiellonian University is the uh, most uh, important university in Poland, and oncology was uh, something uh, that was underdeveloped at the time when I came to uh, Krakow and I got the position there as the head of the department. And I was asked to actually uh, improve the university oncology to improve uh, the uh, importance of uh, university uh, cancer center because uh, there were some other uh, comprehensive cancer centers in the city where I'm now residing, but the university oncology in terms mainly of medical oncology was underdeveloped. And uh, what I did and what I have achieved over the last eight years, it was actually from a relatively small uh, cancer treatment site, uh, I have created one of the biggest uh, medical oncology units in Poland with uh, more than 2,500 patients in continuous treatment. Uh, at our side. So we have like uh, 2,500 individual patients being consulted and treated every single month. And wow. the responsibility, well, well, actually you have to know that the numbers in Poland and in relationship to the general population with this 38 million, it's like 200,000 new ca cancer cases a year. So mm. it's a huge number. And there is like uh, 1,200 medical oncologists in Poland. So just imagine the extent of uh, work and, and the workload that medical oncologists are facing every day, having so many patients uh, requiring uh, systemic treatment uh, and the workload is really high. We have achieved the uh, generation of a really uh, huge cancer treatment site. And uh, this is something that is beyond comparison to other uh, medical systems in, in Europe because the number of cancer patients, the reimbursement of, of many of new drugs and the improvement in cancer patient survival uh, is not actually um, followed by the number of uh, medical oncologists in Poland. So gotcha. many, uh, well, many of my colleagues from different uh, countries in Europe, uh, they cannot believe how big the workload uh, is uh, for medical oncologists in Poland. But it is really the problem and uh, the challenge that all of the uh, heads of, of cancer sites in Poland are facing is how to deal with the huge numbers of patients having really small numbers of nurses and, and uh, oncologists. And this is the huge challenge, which requires mm -hmm. a lot of organizational skills, uh, how to you know, make all this work 
in the case of really uh, difficult uh, situation. And can I, like you mentioned, the numbers are really high. Like, um, is it this comparable, like, to Europe? Is it comparable, like, to the general incidence of cancer cases per world? And why do you think, like, the incidence of cancer is higher in your area, or like, or do you have less oncologists per capita? Where do you think the problem lies? Well, this is multi-directional problem. The main reason is that actually. Uh, the medical, well, the health system in Poland is insufficient in comparison to other Western European countries. The number of medical doctors per uh, 100,000 uh, people is the lowest or almost the lowest in European Union. Mm -hmm. And again, we have seen tremendous progress in the efficacy of systemic treatment of cancer patients in Poland, because actually the number of doctors is not increasing, but the availability of novel drugs is increasing. So we see improvement in the outcomes and the numbers of patients requiring continuous systemic treatment are rapidly increasing. Yeah. But the number of uh, medical oncologists is not increasing at the same pace. And additionally, since we have low numbers of, of general practitioners, of low numbers of radiologists or of surgeons, uh, many patients are being diagnosed at more advanced stage than it should mm -hmm. be if we have better general health system. So therefore, you have more patients who, cancer patients who require uh, neoadjuvant treatment, who require more aggressive adjuvant treatment. And this is also th something that should not be that often if we had the sufficient number of, well, general practitioners and, and surgeons, because then those patients can be diagnosed earlier, can be treated with surgery alone, and there will be not that high load uh, for, for medical oncologists. And additionally, uh, the well, many uh, former uh, East European countries, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. Soviet bloc countries, the uh, understanding of uh, healthy uh, s s lifestyles or of some uh, preventive measures, how to decrease the risk of cancer have been not well known at the time. So, well, the healthy lifestyle, this is something that actually is now being understood, but for many older Poles, uh, the problem is that they have been exposed to very uh, various uh, carcinogenic agents to air pollution, to, well, uh, non-healthy lifestyles. And we are now, you know, facing the problems that have been, uh, well, accumulating over the last three, four decades. So, this is a very multi-directional problem. There is not uh, an easy solution for this, but I am, well, I think that many former uh, countries that were in the Eastern Europe uh, under the influence of Soviet Union, uh, they face similar problems, but mm -hmm. actually in Poland, due to the low numbers of doctors, it's more evident. Gotcha. Since we're talking about Poland, the healthcare system there, um, can you give me like some insight how oncology is practiced? Um, how does the healthcare infrastructure operates? Like, is it a private healthcare system? Is it a public healthcare system? Who pays for the treatment? Well, uh, in Poland, uh, starting with the communism and 
just after the Second World War, it was said that everything is for free. And actually, even after we well got free from from Soviet Union, everything is still for free. We have only uncentralized uh, healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone is well actually made to pay for this, but the treatment is the same for uh, all of Poles. So actually, everyone uh, has its well national health policy. Everyone is in the system. So there is no private insurances. Everything is paid by the government, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which is not uh, the best option because, well, there is a trend to, and there is increasing willingness to introduce the, the private uh, health system mm -hmm. because it will improve the uh, efficacy. It will improve the quality and also the access to novel drugs, uh, but it's very difficult politically to you know, introduce the private health system just to define that there are some, uh, there are some polls that will have some better options like, you know, uh, better access to, or faster access to some, there are unique uh, medical technologies, uh, faster access to drug reimbursement, because for the last, well, it's now almost 70 years, everyone had the same access to, to the health system. So no one wants to change it because it may yeah. be very difficult uh, in politic terms. Yeah, I, I hear you. Like I did my training in Canada and currently in the U.S. And it's, it's uh, so that sounds like the Canadian healthcare system where like everyone pay taxes and those taxes go towards the healthcare, um, uh, like the fund that goes to pay for healthcare. It has its uh, own like pros and cons. When I moved to the U.S., I think also here like it's uh, people paid for insurance, so it's private. There is some government. Uh, paid uh, programs like Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, but that being said, like um, being in both countries, Canada and the US, both of them have their own pros and cons. Like for example, for example, in the US, I had last couple of weeks, I had two patients, one of them I couldn't treat uh, because like they didn't have insurance. Uh, so uh, pa patient who presented with, with like pancytopenia and then we thought it's APML or AML, and then we found that he's like severely deficient with vitamin B12. So it was like simple treatment, um, but we couldn't establish a follow up. So we just uh, uh, recommended for him to get an insurance or family help to start him on treatments. And then, like another patient who had an insurance, but they couldn't come and see me where I work. It was like their insurance is not accepted uh, in the hospital where I work. So they had to go to another healthcare provider or an oncologist. Uh, which I find interesting. So each country has its own pros and cons. Um, so we touched about uh, on the healthcare um, practice. Tell me a bit about like uh, the oncology research. How would you describe the, the state of research and the availability of different treatments in Poland when compared to the, the global, when, when compared to globally? Well, uh... Regarding the access to novel drugs, uh, Poland is the so-called HDA country. So where all the reimbursement decisions are made based on H uh, health technology assessment and the, well, uh, evaluation if the price is right in terms of the benefit the patients get from particular treatment. So it takes time uh, till the analysis uh, and uh, then risk sharing discussions are made uh, just you know to uh, will make the decisions whether a drug will be reimbursed or not so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what what we see is that we don't have access to the drugs uh, as soon as for example in germany when they get reimbursement while, while, once the drugs are approved in the European Union, 
But on the other hand, the HDA policy, which is typical for Poland, for example, also like in the UK, it takes time till the drugs are reimbursed, but the cost of the drugs is much lower than in other countries because the government is discussing with the uh, pharma companies and are discussing the real uh, benefit, the uh, the uh, for macroeconomic analysis and, uh, you know, Poland is not a small country. So the pharma companies, actually, they uh, strive to, uh, to sell the drugs in Poland. But uh, on the other hand, they know that they have to decrease the price or they have to make some risk sharing agreements while they, for example, offer some other of their drugs uh, much cheaper just to have the novel drug uh, reimbursed. So this is why, even though we don't have any private health system, many of the relatively novel, innovative drugs are being uh, reimbursed. So this is, from the medical point of view, this is, well, it could be faster, but it's okay that we have the access to the drugs in the general population. But uh, while talking about research, it's not only uh, basic research, it's also some tr translational research and clinical research. Mm -hmm. It's not that easy. Uh, first, this is uh, Poland, uh, even though it's a European country, uh, European Union country, uh, the uh, money that is spent for uh, science and for research for GDP is one of the lowest in the European Union. And if we are talking about clinical research, uh, it's also very difficult because uh, in order to uh, pursue any medical studies, you have to have the team and the team of people who are dedicated and have some free time to spend for the clinical research. And since there is not too many medical doctors and actually the number of medical doctors is insufficient for the healthcare needs, it's even harder to find doctors or dedicated people who will take part in the clinical studies. So. We wish it would be better, but uh, we are, you know, looking for options to attract more and more residents uh, for uh, to attract them for medical oncology, showing also the opportunity of taking part in clinical trials. And, and you know, it's not only, you know, uh, doing the clinical research, but it's also a way to get some additional uh, salary because in Poland, the system allows uh, the sub investigators and then study nurses and then data managers to be remunerated for their activities in clinical trials. So this is also uh, an incentive to, to do the uh, clinical studies. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I think the research, that's, uh, that's where the problem lies, right? Like it's, you mentioned like you you can hardly find people who can able to fulfill the clinical requirements, and then it's much more harder to find people to do the research. It's um, it's sometimes a bit tricky because like all researchers all over the world, I think uh, re research it comes really from people who are passionate about it. It's hard, and you need passion, and uh, not everyone is willing to sacrifice the time. It it needs tons and tons and tons of hours. Um, talking about that, I was going through your background. You had extensive publication record, and you have more than like 70 international, even more clinical studies. So what advice would you have or would you extend to early stage oncologists, let's say like me, who are aiming to thrive in academia and the clinical research? Well, uh, first of all, it's, it's well, uh, medical oncology, oncology, hematology is extremely unique field because actually everything that happens and everything that you may be involved in can have immediate impact on the cancer care. 
I mean, this is something so well unique and overwhelming for people involved in the clinical studies that actually what you are doing, you can feel it like in two or three years after you are conducting the clinical study that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your work, your engagement can change the fate of patients. This is something that cannot be compared to any other speciality. And this is very important. And other aspects is actually that uh, medical oncology, and I think also chematology, is such a wide field for research. You can find your own place in that, and you can pursue your goals. And you can do some unique studies, even though they are they can be small, but all those well constructed and well designed studies can finally have some impact on the activity of cancer treatment, on the safety of cancer treatment, on the quality of life of patients. So there's so many aspects you can improve by being engaged in clinical research and basic research and translational research, which is beyond comparison to any other speciality. How would you, what is like, if you're going to give like a secret recipe that help you to be proliferative researchers and researcher and publish a lot, what would you say help you the most? Well, there's difficult, well, there's different options, but I think the most important is to have a proper mentor. Because especially when you are young uh, and you are in the training to become oncologist, uh, you have to, you know, concentrate on, on your main goal, which is being, uh, becoming the consultant, be, being, uh, well, approved by the board. And if you don't have a mentor who can actually take you by hand and, and show you what is important, where to concentrate, and can help you develop your skills, it is very difficult to do it alone. So I think that for young oncologists, finding a proper mentor, it's the most important point. Because once you have someone who takes care of you and who will actually help you to develop your unique scientific abilities, it will actually speed up all other uh, processes and will actually pave you the way to do your own research. And I think this is the, the most important point because the mentor knows what is what is interesting, knows how to pursue your goals, how to do the research step by step, and he is responsible to teach you how to do this. But once you get the knowledge, you will know by yourself how to do it further. You touch base on very important, which is close to my heart too. I think having the right mentor in, in residency, I I struggled in this until I found the right I found the right person who was a great mentor for me. Um, Dr. Mark Carrier, he's like he was amazing. He he used to meet meet with me um, every week or two and like uh, take time off just to meet with me in half an hour, and that helps a lot just to keep me on track. Um, I found that very helpful. From your own perspective, what are the things that young uh, oncologists who are starting in this field, they should look for when they are looking for a mentor? Let's say if you're going to go back in your early career and you're going to start looking for a mentor, what are the, the things that you look for in the mentor and how would you find them? Well, uh, this is a difficult question, but actually you have for, well, you, you have to do some research regarding mentors uh, because there's opinions on, on some mentors by their mentees who are, uh, and the mentees can say 
if it was what they expected or not. Mm -hmm. So first is just doing research and then looking for some well recognized uh, persons, not only recognized from the scientific point of view, but also from purely human point of view, because mm -hmm. to be a mentor, it's not enough to have the knowledge. Because especially in oncology, uh, it's also very important how uh, the person uh, who is about to be the mentor behaves, how he, because it's not only that someone has to learn, teach you how to, you know, do some research and some, some experiments, but for medical oncologists who are looking for mentors who would help them not only uh, develop the, the scientific part of their activities, but also the clinical part of their activities, because, well, it's very difficult to do, to have a mentor who are helping you to develop your clinical uh, uh, potential and mm -hmm. another mentor who will help you to develop your uh, scientific skills, because then it may be difficult, you know, to uh, put it all together. So it's the best option is to have a mentor, which can help you to develop your clinical skills and will will help you to develop your scientific skills. So especially in the field of oncology, it's very, very important to uh, know the personality of, of the mentor, how he uh, talks to the patients, what's the, his level of empathy, because how he uh, acts in the front of patients. It is actually the same, how he will act in the front of you as a mentee. So this is very important because you have to learn actually at the same time how to be a good oncologist and how to be a good scientist. And it's, uh, you know, having the proper mentor can solve all the problems because mm -hmm. he will teach you the empathy, the way of talking to patients, the way of treating the patients, the way of understanding the disease. And at the same time, how your understanding of the disease can pave the ways to uh, doing research. Because otherwise it may be very difficult, you know, doing some very basic research in the lab, totally unrelated to your medical oncology or chemotology training. So the best option is to have a mentor that can help you develop your skills uh, simultaneously. Yeah, I can't agree more when, especially when it comes to basic research. Like I find like basic research, like it's a, it, it, it's a hidden, um, scary part that not lots of clinicians go there but like if you don't have a mentor it could be even much scarier like uh, it's uh, it's it's very challenging especially in the lab spending tons of hours uh, by yourself doing experiments writing uh, down the results um, yeah but you know what I find it is it's it's hard it's a bit hard I don't know if it's different in Poland is um, especially like at the size of organization so sometimes when you are in a medium to small size organization you know people closely right and you can develop like one-to-one -one relationship with them and then when you go to a bigger organization it becomes very hard to develop that one-to-one -one close relationship with one mentor that can help you in both uh, clinical and research because like there's also like lots of turnover so for example one week you work with this person another week you work with that person so it becomes a bit harder to develop uh, that relationship but I agree with you about the point that you mentioned that asking other mentees how the relationship was was with the mentor that's a huge indicator on how or like it gives you idea how or what would you expect from your relationship with them yeah definitely I mean uh, and well uh, doing uh oncology residency and uh, some basic scientific research is extremely difficult because mm -hmm. sometimes when you talk to guys who are involved in basic research, 
you may notice that they are pursuing some goals which are clinically irrelevant. I mean, they are looking for some answers which are actually not needed in the clinics. And mm -hmm. what is very important is, you know, having the option to uh, connect both worlds. Because, and this is what translational research is. Because as, a, as an oncologist, you understand the clinical problem, you have some ideas of the biology of the disease, and you know what the questions can be important that require answers in order to improve them, some clinical aspects. And uh, this is uh, something that people involved totally in basic research cannot understand. They actually do not know what is relevant from clinical point of view. And this is what the research for oncologists is the translational studies. So having the question, clinical question, and trying to answer it. You can, of course, talk to guys who are involved in basic science. You have the problem. You ask them to help you to find a way how to answer the question. So what, what basic studies, some cell cultures can, well, give you some hints to, to answer the question. But the most important part is you have the clinical background and you want to make it into research and the translational research the question why why something that i see in the clinic is looking this way uh to find the answer uh and if you have the mentor he will help you to you know find a way contact the proper people who can uh, help you to answer this question. You don't have to do this by yourself. You have to know with whom, with whom to talk about it. Yeah, I can't agree more. I can't. You're bringing lots of flashbacks from residency and remembering the people who helped me, um, and so on. Um, okay, so, so sh sh shifting gears a bit, uh, you've been in the field and you have lots of experience. Um, how do you feel like the the field of clinical oncology, uh, especially in areas of immunophoresis and metronomic chemotherapy-based therapies, change uh, since you started your career? Well, uh, immunophoresis, this is a concept of, uh, you know, getting rid of some soluble factors from bloodstream. This is a an idea which is very interesting, but unfortunately, at this time point, some pharma companies that have uh, developed this idea, they do not have enough funds to, you know, pursue clinical studies. But this this concept is very interesting if you have the proper platform that can, you know, based on some. As you do apheresis in hematology, you just, you know, uh, you don't have to collect uh, uh, blood cells, but you just uh, pour the uh, plasma through the filter and you get rid of some soluble factors which may improve the outcomes of patients, improve the quality of life, decrease the uh, toxicity. But at this time point, it's too early to talk about the clinical relevance of, of this strategy. But talking about metronomic chemotherapy. This is something uh, so extremely important for clinical practice, uh, especially in medical oncology, that I couldn't uh, stress more how important the area of metronomic chemotherapy can be for medical oncology worldwide. This is something that you can, you know, teach all drugs to do new tricks because <laughs> metronomic chemotherapy this is a way of uh, a way of giving chemotherapy agents cytotoxic agents at low doses uh, but in short intervals uh, unlike in hematology where the majority of uh, uh, diseases neoplastic diseases are actually single cell based 
diseases with high proliferation rate and medical oncology, especially in the solid tumors, the proliferation rate of uh, tumor cells is relatively low. So when we talk about, for example, breast cancer, proliferation rate uh, expressed by KI-67 above 20% is pretty high. Mm -hmm. And many mm -hmm. patients have much lower proliferation rate, like 15, 10%. And when you think about how chemotherapy works, it actually blocks proliferation uh, of cells. And while it stops proliferation, the cells undergo apoptosis. But the common way of giving chemotherapy, which has been developed over the last 70 years, was giving chemotherapy at, the, at maximum tolerated doses. So the doses that have been defined in clinical trials, how much you can give at one time point, and then you have like three weeks of uh, uh, recovery period uh, until you can give the maximum tolerated dose again. But if you have tumors with low proliferation rate, like 20%, you can, even though you give the maximum tolerated dose, you actually can kill approximately 20% of cells if the proliferation rate is like 20% of ki 67 and then you have like three weeks of the recovery period for your uh, bone marrow to recover, but also for the tumor cells, uh, for the tumors to recover in the 80% of non-proliferating cells at the time of uh, chemotherapy can then repopulate and the cells which are more resistant to chemotherapy can repopulate mm -hmm. uh, faster. And the whole concept of metronomic chemotherapy is just giving the chemotherapy in shorter intervals and in lower doses just to, you know, have the impact on those uh, slower proliferating tumors. Uh, and uh, the most unique concept of metronomic chemotherapy is giving the chemotherapy on a daily basis, which can be done right. with orally available drugs. And... Metronomic chemotherapy uh, was actually ignited by the ability, uh, availability of uh, oral uh, chemotherapy agents like capsidabine, cyclophosphamide, mm -hmm. metotrexate, uh, venerolbin, topotecan, etoposide. And uh, the, well, the concept is not very young. Because mm -hmm. orally available drugs have been used in clinical practice uh, for the last, I think, 30 years. But what we have uh, developed in the area of metronomic chemotherapy, uh, it was based on some preliminary discussions and studies that uh, especially for the low and middle income uh, countries, metronomic chemotherapy, which possesses not only anti-proliferative activity, but also because it's given on a continuous basis, it can act as an anti-angiogenic therapy. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in order to stop proliferation of endothelial cells, uh, you have to have a continuous concentration of the cytotoxic agent. So then it turns out that you can uh, act as an anti-angiogenic therapy using metronomic chemotherapy. And additionally, it turned out that metronomic chemotherapy can also decrease the tumor-induced immunosuppression mm -hmm. because unlike high-dosed uh, chemotherapy, which is totally immunosuppressive, uh, metronomic chemotherapy can... Uh, decrease the activity of some immunosuppressive cells like T regulatory cells or uh, or uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells and uh, there were some discussions that maybe metronomic chemotherapy can be the option to overcome the unavailability of uh, unique molecular uh, targeted agents in low and middle income countries but uh, also in Poland, we had problems with the access to novel drugs. As I said, we had to wait for reimbursement until our government uh, came to an agreement with some pharma companies. And we have faced 
uh, lack of access to CDK4-6 inhibitors in breast cancer patients. Because uh, the drugs were very popular in Western Europe, many of our patients asked to be treated with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, but we have not, uh, we, we didn't have access to the drugs and it took like four years to for the drugs wow. to be reimbursed. So it was a very, very long time because, you know, there was no overall survival data. And if you don't have overall survival data, it's really difficult to evaluate the quality adjusted life years. And therefore, it was so Fair difficult you know, to, to get the reimbursement. And we decided at that time, so looking at the mechanism of action of CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are actually cycle-specific antiproliferative agents, Mm -hmm. We decided mm -hmm. to give our patients metronomic chemotherapy combined with endocrine treatment. And it turned out that it's very, very efficient. I mean, it, it, we've seen so many patients with dramatic responses to this kind of combination of combination of endocrine treatment and metronomic chemotherapy that we have started to use the combinations in various clinical settings and various tumors, combining it with a uh, standard uh, uh, targeted agents uh, when it was possible because it's very well controlled in Poland if patients are treated uh, with the reimbursed drugs according to the defined standards. So it is difficult to give the patients some, uh, let's say, of the books uh, agents, but we, we, we were able to do this and we were able to show it, for example, that patients treated with anti-HER2 agents receiving uh, metronomic chemotherapy, even though they are progressing on anti-HER2 agents alone. Uh, for example, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer patients who have been treated with docetaxel, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab after stopping docetaxel, so they were receiving pertuzumab and trastuzumab, and they showed some signs of progression. Introducing metronomic chemotherapy could just revert the problem uh, process and the patient uh, started to respond again. Uh, we have seen the same in heavily pretreated patients with uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. They have been treated with targeted agents and they, they well, actually were resistant and we decided to, to use the imatinib combined with metronomic chemotherapy. The patient started to respond again, even though they could not respond to imatinib anymore and to standard metronomic chemotherapy. They also are not responding, but combining the drugs actually improved the, the outcomes. We see the same situation with combining with PARP inhibitors and the history goes uh, really uh, uh, in a really uh, fascinating way. It's of course difficult to conduct large scale clinical studies because no pharma mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. is interested in supporting this kind of trials, but we are looking for ways how to uh, pursue the, the clinical studies with metronomic chemotherapies. And it's really fascinating because unlike with other uh, chemotherapy regimens, using metronomic chemotherapy, having the option to give the drugs on a daily basis, having like three or four metronomic cytotoxic agents given uh, simultaneously, you can adjust the treatment based on the toxicity and efficacy. So we see like giving three drug regimens, for example, the, the standard regimen in, in breast cancer, which is VEX, so it's venerelbin, cyclophosphamide, and capsidabin, sometimes combined also with metotrexate, you see if the patient develops any signs of toxicity, for example, head and foot syndrome, hand and foot syndrome, in the case of capsidabin, you can just decrease capsidabin, but increase, for example, venerelbin. So you keep the patient's uh, controlled that you keep the disease controlled, but you can like adjust like in the old hi-fi music systems, the equalizer. You just, you know, 
<laughs> increase one, one dose of one drug, you decrease the, uh, another. And in the case of chronic cancer treatment, because metronomic chemotherapy, this is not a way of curative treatment. It's a just mm -hmm. a purely palliative systemic treatment. You can do such a wonderful uh, personalized uh, treatment approaches that is, well, mind blowing. And, and we, wow. have, we have so many examples of patients, like we had a patient with uh, squamous cell cancer mm -hmm. of his uh, popliteal region. We didn't have access to immunotherapy at the time, but using some well uh, constructed chemo metronomic chemotherapy regimens, we achieved uh, complete response and the patient is disease free uh, now more than three years after we started the treatment. So this is something, especially for low and middle income countries where having very cheap drugs, but using those drugs wisely, you can really make uh, a difference. Wow, that's very interesting. Like, and I think the need is the mother of invention. Uh, having that need to figure out something what we can, what you can do with the tools available, uh, led to the more innovation in this field. Um, it's we are almost at time. I don't want to take your time more, but I just have one last question. Um, are there any uh, new technologies or techniques in your view? that will significantly influence the treatment paradigm uh, or advance the cancer care in the soon future? Uh, well, I think better understanding of the disease, not only you know using the novel drugs, the novel mm -hmm. drugs are very, very important, especially if you have a novel targets and then novel technologies, but what is, for me, um, a very sad situation is actually that with the novel drugs, you forget your old lessons. Mm -hmm. And this is, for example, uh, what, what, what we see with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, many novel drugs are um, very active, but also very toxic. And yeah. sometimes you have to look at the old lessons on the old options, how to, you know, using wisely older drugs, uh, how you can mitigate some toxicities of novel agents, which is uh, actually not well known, but what I think and what I hope it will change in oncology, it will be that not only the novel unique agents are critical for the progress in oncology. It is a wise using of all available op options. Mm -hmm. And this is also understanding. And it's happening slowly, but it's happening that Every patient is really unique, not only in the terms of comorbidities and tumor type, but also of his expectations, his goals. And many times, less is more. So you don't have to treat all the patients with all the newest drugs at the very early stage of the disease, I mean, the first line of palliative treatment. Understanding what is really important for the patient, understanding how to talk to the patient, providing him or her options of less intensive treatment to improve quality of life and to prolong the disease control is extremely important. And what makes me upset is that with a very intense pressure made by pharma companies, 
we tend again to move the novel but also aggressive treatments to the early stages yes which i agree with that and you know some improvement in terms of overall response rate for example mm -hmm. but it's not only that you have to concentrate on the first line of treatment you have to keep in mind that our patients will live longer and longer and it's not only activity but it's also toxicity and sometimes being too aggressive at the first or at the earlier stages of the systemic treatment it also means you are all, you is you are more aggressive and the aggressiveness sometimes is uh, more um, evident than the benefit. So I think, and I hope that the field of oncology will move finally to the situation that we will look at the disease and decide if the disease is aggressive, we act in, a, in an aggressive manner. If the disease is not in a hurry, we are not in a hurry. So it's not only that the two more types means it matters that the uh, patient comorbidities matter, but also the vision of the patient and of the doctor and the patient has to be the most important actor in the whole process. And we have to adapt our decisions to what the patient needs, wants, and uh, craves for. No, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I, you, you said many things that really resonates with me. It's not about the number. It's not about only over the, the overall survival. It's also like the quality of life that the person will have during that time. And I hope with the new technologies that we have, um, we can have a better way to unique, ev to, to treat every cancer um, in a unique way. Uh, I think cancer, uh, one of my great mentors said like uh, to me, cancer is an orphan disease. Each cancer is unique. There is no cancer that looks like to each other. So knowing the the activity of or the progression of a specific cancer in a specific patient will help you to treat that patient in a unique way. And you cannot generalize the treatment on everyone. And, and what what is there? Also very important, it's not only that the disease is, is unique in particular patient, especially in, in solid tumors. Every single mm -hmm. metastasis can be unique and you have to understand the disease. Because sometimes, for example, in breast cancer, it's yeah. really evident that, for example, you treat the patient with bone mats with endocrine treatment and you see that the patient progresses she develops liver mats. So if you switch your treatment, for example, to chemotherapy, to treat the liver mats, you control the liver mats, but the bone mats are progressive. Why? That's right. Because, because if you understand, and this is what I always want my residents to understand. You're talking, in, in the case of disseminated uh, metast uh, disease, you're talking about the standard Darwinian law, the fittest will survive. And therefore mm -hmm. you have, you know, various diseases in various regions. And you have to think how to combine your treatment because you cannot concentrate only on one enemy because you have different enemies who are, well, uh, who are developing in a different way or achieving different features. And the longer you treat the patients, the more difficult is it, it is to treat the patient. And you have to understand, you have to have a holistic view of the disease to be really effective in what you're doing. Wow, that's really interesting way because like, you know, like we think about it, sorry, I, I don't wanna take your time, but I think this is very interesting way of thinking about metastasis, which I never thought about. Because like, okay, so the disease metastasize and then with switch treatment, that means treatment failure. But that's an, another way of looking at it. I think tailoring the treatment based on the microenvironment of the disease 
and where does this survive? Because like, as you said, I don't think the micro environment, again, I'm not a, a I don't have the understanding of the basic micro environment of each tumor meds, but I don't think the micro environment of the bone is similar to the micro environment of the liver. Uh, maybe the vasculature in the liver and maybe like anti-vascular uh, vascular growth factor yeah. work better for liver meds versus bone meds. You need, uh, for example, the enosumab or zanadronic acid. Yeah, but again, you have also a genomically unstable disease. So every single cell exactly. can get random uh, mutations and then mutations can drive the disease in a different way, just exactly as Darwin said. I mean, mutations make the clones and the fittest will survive. So you, you make the pressure like, like you know, there was a pressure on 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 the uh, uh, some some organisms on the islands uh, that Darwin uh, explored, and you are putting the same pressure on two more cells, and they have you know to find uh, a random feature which will help to survive. But for example, a cell in the lung uh, will find a different way how to become resistant than the cell in, in the liver. And then you have to, well, look at this and sometimes, you know, come to the idea how to treat the uh, disease. And here comes the metronomic chemotherapy very handy because we are using like, for example, four drug regimens, which, mm -hmm. in, which in uh, medical oncology is totally uh, unaccepted. If you are talking about like intravenous three drug regimens, you cannot do this. It's so toxic. But using like metronomic chemotherapy combined with uh, like oral daily chemotherapy combined with some weekly uh, chemotherapy agents, you can really combine like four or even five drugs together. And you have a mixture that is totally unique to the patient. And if you follow the history of the patient and you know which uh, metastatic lesions responded to which kind of treatment, you can then, you know, combine it based on your previous experience. So this is, this is the personalization <laughs> of cancer treatment and it really works. And, and I don't know, like in, in hematology, but in medical oncology, it's, it's really kind of personalization. I can't agree more. Um, this has been a fascinating hour for me. I learned a lot and, uh, there are many things now for me, lots of food for my thoughts. Uh, so I have to grasp. Thank you so much. I don't want to take your time. I know it's now almost like nine or 10 o'clock. Um, your time? Seven. 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 Okay. It's seven. Okay. All, almost dinner time. I appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining me today. Okay. It was a pleasure.